Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for making the time to be here with me today. Uh, again, my name is Ron Rivers. I'm the author of Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis. I'm a co-founding member of Spirit Dow, which is a community of people uh, embracing the philosophies and practices outlined in the text. Uh, and in my past professional life, I've been everything from a founder with an exit to a nonprofit executive director and primarily serve in the social good, social impact space, uh, which was a big inspiration for the text today. Um, so I'm so excited to chat with you and we'll, we'll just dive in. So Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis is a book that develops new frameworks of meaning and value informed by cosmology and physics. The core intent is to bind spiritual renaissance to systemic reformation, which I argue is necessary to transcend the crisis. It's also necessary to free the present from the influence of the past. And we'll talk a lot about what that means in a bit. Um, in many ways, when you see the age of crisis, that can mean a lot of things. It's often referred to as the meta crisis. And essentially what it means is we live at the best time ever to be alive, right? It's, there's never been a pinnacle of human history greater than now. Um, but at the same time, we're surrounded by many crises, any which of would, you know, one would be bad enough, but collectively form you know, what seems to be an insurmountable obstacle to kind of transcend. And we're gonna dive exactly what that means and, and what those crises are in a bit. But ultimately, uh, I'm gonna talk a lot today about systems. And I wanna kind of just set some context. When I say the word system, what I mean is any set of law, economics, politics, spirituality that governs the relationships between two people. Okay, so those can, and those influence us internally, but we influence our, ourselves externally. And ultimately, our discussion today is about choice. It's about the choice to embrace what is instead of what we prefer it to be, even if that means letting go of some of our most deeply held dogmas. So let's dive in. I'm gonna start just by talking about the crisis, right? because we all kind of know this to some extent, but I wanna kind of dive into the specifics of what I'm referring to. Now in the book, I do I analyze the crisis from six specific verticals. The first is the crisis of extinction. Now, this is probably the most common one, where we hear a lot about climate change, we hear a lot about the, the warming climate in relation to human efforts. Um, you know, just some quick facts, right? The ice caps are melting, oceans are shrinking, lakes are shrinking, our forests are disappearing, our deserts are expanding. Um, fun fact, it, today, we experience natural disasters at a rate of 10 times more frequently than we did in 1960. So in 60 years, a 10x increase in the amount of natural disasters occurring around the world. What's not often talked about with the climate crisis is that we are in the midst of a sixth major extinction. About 70% of the animal species surveyed today are expected to be extinct. In, over the next 100, 200 years. This matters because the crisis of extinction is going to have profound implications for how food is grown, what areas are habitable on this planet, where we can access fresh water. And this is going to disrupt the livelihoods of many people. Uh, and especially when we think about like water and food, the most uh, evident course, if we view history, will be war, will be violence, et cetera. Uh, you said this is the sixth major extinction. Yeah, and and five continues. Correct. Somehow mankind struggled through those. No, mankind wasn't around for those. I'm talking about like the dinosaurs, right? The anthropy extinction. Um, this is the first extinction that we are directly related to causing uh, and have been around for. The the only there there was a major extinction of humanity, like I, I think a couple hundred thousand years ago. Uh, in South America, a meteorite hit and it wiped out like 90 plus percent of the population in that area. But in terms of like industrial age humanity, uh, this is our first kind of combating a, a, an age of extinction that we can directly correlate to our own actions. Um, so that, that's kind of an important note, note to it, but I appreciate that. The second crisis is the crisis of what I argue is the billionaire God King. So let me, you know, this is a sensitive topic. So let, let's talk about what it is and is not. Ultimately, the argument against the billionaire God King is humanity will never be free in a society of class and caste. It is not an argument that's anti-luxury. It's not an argument against anti-private enterprise. It's not an argument against private experimentation, private property, et cetera. It is an argument in organizing against organizing law, economics, politics, 
to prioritize birth lottery as the most important event of our lives. Today, wealth is primarily dynastic, right? We inherit it from our families. If you are born statistically today, if you were born in abject poverty, you will spend the, the rest of your life in abject poverty. So the vast majority of people who are born into those worlds have no opportunities of exiting those worlds. Not only is that accurate in the US, it's accurate around the world, right? We're very fortunate here. Uh, but there's many places in the world where they, they don't have those benefits. So ultimately, when we think about the crisis of the billionaire God King, it's also in relation to today we embrace a really dogmatic approach to the organization of law and politics. And what I mean by that is we embrace what I would call like a single market maximalism, the idea that it's capitalism or nothing, right? And what that ultimately boils down to is our laws of property and contract. So we apply a single framework of property and contract to every vertical that exists. Now, obviously, one might imagine that that might not be ideal. And in fact, legal history, there's nothing about the legal history of the United States that, that demands a single form of property and contract. So what I'll argue later on is that we have the capacity uh, and the blueprints already exist to have a variety of versions of property and contract exist simultaneously, okay? So, and let, we can dive a little bit more into that. Why, why would we want to do that? Well, there are certain things in life that all of us need that we cannot you know, really thrive without. So then the question becomes, should we add an extractive layer to it? A profit-seeking layer, which is essentially extraction of value. My argument is that the answer is no. There should be aspects of our society, whether they be local, state, national, ideally globally, that do not have extractive layers because they serve our collective needs. One example that's really easy is energy. We'll dive more into that in a bit. The third crisis is the crisis of information, truth, and trust. Now, no matter where you fall, this is I want to be clear, this is an apolitical conversation, but no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, I'm sure you might you know, agree that for-profit mainstream news media is essentially a propaganda machine. It's a for-profit company that manuf manufactures division in order to keep its business model, right? And the problem with that business model is that it must become increasingly more sensational. It must become increasingly more intense in the message, in the fear, in the, the questioning of the other. And therefore, we've, we've kind of surrounded ourselves with these systems, right? And I want to emphasize the crisis of information, truth, and trust, and the crisis of the billionaire God King draw from the same problem. We've created systems and we've given them power over us. But our systems do not deserve that power. They are of us. They, they do not deserve power over us. We are more than them. But today we, we inhabit a challenge of no alternatives, right? So we're all propagandized nonstop. And unsurprisingly, there's a, you know, let's consider the United States, there's an ever increasing divide, an ever increasing mistrust of the other. And based on labels, liberal, conservative, they don't mean anything, right? Most Americans, statistically, if you look at just direct polling, agree in many things, but we're told that's not accurate. We're told the other is an enemy. And that's a significant problem in our ability to coordinate ourselves out of the crisis. The fourth crisis I argue is the crisis of elected misrepresentation. So essentially, when we think about politics and the laws governing our relationships today, there's two core challenges. The first is that Throughout the world, we have only what I would argue are weak democracies, minor evolutions of monarchy. In the United States, is the most you know, perfect example we could use. Many of us are familiar with it. The initial drafting of the United States Constitution and who had access and agency within the system was relegated only to property-owning white males. It was exclusionary by design. So when we think about you can improve a system so much, through incremental improvements, but ultimately you're still improving that root of inequity, inequitable design. Not only that, but the systems of government today are designed to create impasse. Now that may have made sense, right? In the, the late 1700s, the 1800s, when information traveled extremely slowly. Today, information is instantaneous. All of us could be in a group chat on our phone today having a conversation and there'd be no latency between our, our communication. The challenge is, Let's consider, for example, the US legislative branch, Congress. So you have the House and the Senate. The House represents the commons, the Senate represent the elite. 
as it always has been intended to be. When a bill passes the House, it goes up to the Senate. If the Senate chooses not to vote on it, there's nothing that can be done. It enters the void. The process must restart. So our mechanisms of change, the very vehicles available to us to transcend the crisis, resist it by design. And we've been dogmatically conditioned to really love these. Now, on top of that, uh, I think this is most apparent in the US, our government is captured. Corporate interests, by and large, statistically have the most outsized influence on getting bills passed. Um, and ever since Citizens United got repealed, I think at this point, approximately a little over 20 years ago, there's been an exponential increase in the amount of money flowing into our elections at all levels. Okay, so we've given our power of collective governance over to those who possess the means to influence and buy decisions. And there's a, you know, there's a, as someone who's been involved deeply in, in local activism and organizing, I was instrumental um, in 2018 in getting the, the $15 minimum wage passed in New Jersey. I was actually recognized by the governor in his state of state address for that. Uh, but ultimately, when we, we think about these mechanisms, all movement organizations, I'm telling you this as someone from the inside, are co opted. The only way to get things passed is to water down what you want do a bunch of PR so the politicians look good. And that way it doesn't truly conflict with their donors too much and you kind of get what you want. And that's kind of the process. So again, our vehicles for change stifle it. The fifth crisis is the crisis of productivity and participation. We live in an era now where an increasingly amount of people are excluded from the productive activities of society, right? So this is nothing new. Right, Pauline and I were talking about AI and you know, where we are with this. If you guys haven't been exploring, it's, it's a really uh, fascinating. I'll, I'll dive a little bit into it a bit. But ultimately, in the past, there was a shortcut. When technology disrupted labor, let's say, for example, in the industrial era, you could take a farmer, you could put them in the factory, and you could say, pull this lever. Pull it all day. Don't do anything. Sit there. Pull the lever. That was very easy. Today, there's no shortcut. You cannot take an assembly line worker, put them in front of a computer and say, write me a Python script to automate this function. It doesn't work. It requires years of technical training. And more importantly than that, it requires a dialectic cooperative framing of work that's not independent. Okay, technology, someone, as a technologist by trade, it's a deeply group activity. It's constant iteration, testing, et cetera. So there's no shortcut. Now, the challenge is not that we're here. The challenge is not that like technology disrupts jobs because that, that's okay and that's not a bad thing. The challenge is that we lack the infrastructure for people to upskill and redirect. So an increasing amount of people are, are left out of the social contract, which I would argue is a, a, a core reason that we're seeing a rise in hate groups, in extreme otherness, in violence, because there's no alternative. You have entire towns in the United States where half the population is addicted to opioids, right? and there's no recourse. And finally, the crisis of doubt, desire, death, and dogmas. This at its heart is a spiritual crisis, and this is gonna be the primary kind of focus of where we're going today. Doubt is the idea that we'll never be enough. We don't find meaning in our efforts. Everything about the world tells us that we need more, we need something else, we need to keep up with the Joneses, what we have is not enough. And we're constantly fed these lines of, of how we, we generate value. And most importantly, it, it binds value to things which is inadequate. Right? It doesn't fully express uh, our capacity and what we are. The crisis of desire is very similar. We always want more. What we have is never enough. We don't feel good about what we have, so we get more. And then shortly after, we don't feel good. And it's this repeating cycle of keeping up with the Joneses. Now, again, doubt and desire, these are human con concepts. We're, we're not gonna get rid of these things. I don't believe in any shape or form. The challenge is not that we have them. The challenge is that we have surrounded ourselves with systems that prey upon them, that prey upon them to extract value from us. So we're perpetually unhappy. And this is especially true if we look at statistics around youth depression. Many of you are familiar with that. It's on a consistent rise, uh, especially over the last 30 years. And I'm someone who, I'm like the last generation I was born in uh, 1984. So I, I've, I've had 12 years of no tech. And then I had the internet when I was 12 and I've been addicted to it ever since, right? So I've been you know, at that kind of cusp and seen this happen. Um, I don't envy the children who are, who are born into global connectivity, right? I'm sure many of us don't, uh, but that's a challenge. The crisis of death is, 
in many ways related to our systems of spirituality. So I want to kind of add some, some pretext about what I'm about to say. I am not here to argue about the good or bad religions have done in the past. I am not here to argue about uh, you know, people who are religious. What I am saying is that all religions are spiritual technologies designed to meet the needs of a moment, to meet the needs of a people in a very specific time experience. Today, the most dominant religions are the salvation religions. When I say salvation, that's the idea that you die and you ascend to heaven, right? So salvation is post-death. I would argue there's several challenges with that in transcending the crisis. And at the heart of the crisis is our death and dogmas. The first challenge with death and divinity lying beyond death is it's an innately hierarchical framework of divinity, of spirituality. Hist history demonstrates, and I think this is evident in the immediate present as well, spiritual hierarchies have long paved the way for mortal hierarchies. When we consider the text, let's, let's consider the salvation religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. In the most literal interpretation, so again, metaphors out the door, these books are manuals of war. They are about reclaiming Holy Land. They are about the embrace of insiders and the coercion or conversion of outsiders. And this has long been the history of spirituality. So it is no surprise that we dogmatically embrace extremely inequitable economics and law because our spirituality is extremely inequitable. More importantly, I would argue that it places divinity beyond death is a, is a false narrative. Divinity is only available in the immediate present. And I'm gonna to talk to you about why that is in a bit. But ultimately, when we think about self-actualization in the age of crisis, it is a, again, an abandonment of dogmas to recognize what is. And I'll, I'll explain what it is in a moment. Ultimately, in our dogmas, of course, it's like the, the biggest challenge of all. It's, it's that we're, it's not that we're here, right? The problem is not that we're here. It's that we've lacked alternatives. This text is essentially a, a framework of an alternative to kind of reorient ourselves with, with again, what is versus what, what dogmas we would prefer to hold on to. So we're going to kind of dive into the alternative and, and exactly what that is. I'm going to start with the history of the universe, because again, I'm going to keep it really high level, no stress. This is, this is some cosmology and physics, but what, I, what we're looking at right now is a map of the universe, the known universe, since its initial expansion point. The quantum fluctuation, I would label as the singularity. So what that means is essentially the first moment the universe existed, the very first moment, the picosecond, and it began to expand. Now, there have been some fascinating revelations in cosmology and physics over the last decade. So it's relatively new information. That period that's labeled inflation, that kind of white period, right in the very beginning, that's also known as the Planck epoch. The Planck epoch is a period in our universal history where the material universe, so all of the atoms, the particles, et cetera, in the universe existed in a superheated unified state. The universe used to be one thing, the entire thing was unified and it was whole. And as it began cooling, it began to separate. Now, why this is profound for physics is because all of our science and in relation, many of our, our systems are based on static principles of the universe. For example, the laws of the universe, thermodynamics, right? space-time and the structure of space-time and gravity, um, strong and weak nuclear forces, things that, that we thought didn't change. We now know that they did change. During the Planck epoch, they were not the same as they are today. As the universe cooled, the laws governing our universe took the form that they presently exist in today. Now that's a really powerful statement because ultimately it really diminishes any legitimacy of dogmas, of static knowledge, of anything not changing because everything about our universe has always been changing since the moment it's of its inception. I want to dive a little bit deeper. What we're looking at right now is a heat map of radiation in the known universe. So Earth isn't even on a speck on here. We can't even see ourselves. In 2018, um, you may be familiar with Roger Penrose, him and a group of other uh, physicists essentially observed radiation in this sector of the universe from the cosmic microwave background older than our universe. Now, this is a really profound discovery. 
Because ultimately what it means is if there is radiation in our universe today that we can observe, of course, it's not in our universe, it's we're, we're observing the past. The only logical conclusion is that there was something before our universe. The common theory put forth, for example, by physicists like Lee Smolin, uh, Penrose, at this point in time is that we live in what is actually a series of sequential universes. So what I mean by that is before this universe, there was one in the past. After this universe, there'll be another one. It is not an argument for the multiverse theory. This is not string theory, because that's untestable, right? This is where, where we, I believe that we exist in a single universe at a time, but there was one before ours. Now, again, another extremely profound discovery. If there are sequential universes, if there was a universe before ours, humanity can never truly observe, right? We are, we're, a, we're floating on a speck of dust in one solar system, in one galaxy, uh, in a universe of trillions of galaxies that we can see. A universe beyond ours is not measurable. We cannot measure it. At the same time, we are forced to choose. Now, if we Turn our attention to the salvation narratives. Oh, and a quick aside, why am I kind of targeting the salvation narratives? It's not because of anything they teach. It's that because they have an outsized impact on the systems governing our relationships. Okay, I would make the argument that all systems essentially um, have represent kind of two core aspects of their creation. They, they have an imprint of their creation. The first is their intended purpose. And the second is the, the frameworks of meaning and value embodied by their creator, which informs the how. How do I get this done? How does this treat people? How do I do these things, right? So it's not a surprise when we look at the systems today that we've inherited, which were essentially created by people who believe deeply in a, a very hierarchical framework of spirituality, that they were exclusionary. Now the salvation narratives would say, there was nothing before. God created the universe from nothing. Now we're faced with an alternative. I would make the argument, and I ask you to consider the fact that we are in fact part of an infinite sequential universes. No beginning, no end. It's absolutely immeasurable from our perspective. Now, this is really a, a critical kind of point I want to hang on to. If, if we have, if we exist in a material reality of sequential universes, we can then identify an observable infinity. That is to say that the material nature of reality that we inhabit despite our perceptions, right? Again, this is physics and cosmology. I, I know this doesn't feel this way, is infinite material change. All of the laws governing the universe are always changing. So this is extremely profound. The idea that there's an observable infinity represents two things. You know, A, we are both within this universe in our own fractional embodiment, right? All of us kind of in our own perspectives, but we're also of this universe. Humanity is most literally an embodiment of infinity in a fractional sense, because that is the nature of the universe, the material nature of the universe. I also wanna talk about the changing nature of time. In the book, I argue that time is not numbers on a clock, right? That's kind of what we've been conditioned to do. It's our like local time around the sun. In reality, time is the experience of awareness. And the nature of time is changing. And what I mean by that is we are in an era of exponential growth, exponential progress, right? We most commonly refer to as technology. Um, last year, we produced more data than there are stars in the known universe, more bits of data, okay? And that's only growing exponentially as well. Uh, the crisis is expanding exponentially. Exponential growth is in many, many different aspects of our life. The universe itself, if you're not aware, is expanding exponentially. Uh, it started about 5 billion years ago. It started to double its growth. And a quick aside, exponential growth means um, that a point of measurement doubles in size at each kind of point of measurement. So it's constantly doubling. Now, this is really critical because I would argue that the exponential expansion of the universe, technology, data, et cetera, information is changing the way that we literally experience reality. And I'll give a, a very great example. Uh, we, we may be familiar with chat GPT, artificial intelligence, large language models. If not, essentially, we are now at the age of self-learning machines. Uh, and this is the... By far, I would argue that the most profound discovery humanity's ever made, um, akin to like fire. Uh, some people argue the printing press. I think it's way, way, way bigger than that. Um, but ultimately, I'll, I'll give a personal example. So I'm a technologist by trade, technical generalist. These new tools have quite literally shaved off about 
five years of, of training and learning in that I am able to write programs today in this immediate present that I could not have written two months ago. And I can do them in 20 minutes when it would have taken me weeks to do. I am able to do more with my moments now than ever before. And this is only, we're scratching the surface. Like the next 20 years, this is gonna be a Cambrian explosion of, of technology and ascension. So the changing nature of time is really important to consider alongside the infinite material nature of reality. And the two form, and this is gonna be the most provocative claim I'm gonna to make today, but I'm gonna argue it to you, for the single truth. There is a single truth governing reality today. It's change. We live in an infinite material reality where everything around the universe is constantly in motion. Why is it the single truth? It's because all human knowledge, all thought, ideas, all everything we, we think about is bound to it. And eventually, in the longest possible scale, when this universe has its heat death, black holes converge on each other, they sit there for what is likely eons before another universe erupts, that knowledge will be lost. And present theories believe that the, so each universe has kind of some of the properties of the old one, but not all, kind of like giving birth to a kid. Right? I have a two and a half year old, she kind of looks like me, acts like her mom. Uh, so it's, you know, when we think about universes in that context, we understand that that information, even, even if we were able to, for example, inject information to a black hole to be extracted, um, it could never be recalled perfectly because the, the rules governing that next universe will not be the same. So change is a single truth. This is what I would argue is sacred knowledge. And in fact, a knowledge that we can ground our new spiritual project upon. Not only does it kind of throw out the door the idea of impossibilities or, or anything like that, but it grounds our spirituality in nature. And this is, again, returning back to the crisis. When we think about the spiritual context that we inhabit, we've created these religions and we've given them power over us. And they dictate our, our behaviors, they dictate our beliefs. And what we see, and this is very obvious in the immediate present, over time, they've distanced themselves further and further and further from the nature of humanity. They were created to serve a very specific kind of humanity, that humanity has, of course, diverged over time. And progressively, we have to embrace them with like a selective hypocrisy. We choose to embrace these things, but we don't choose to embrace these things, right? So is the question I always ask to the, the fundamentalists. Why do you choose discrimination, but not choose you know, this other aspect that would say this, right? The love aspect. So grounding our spiritual authority in nature is extremely relevant too. A, because let's not forget anatomically modern humans. So people who would be born into these bodies have been around for about 300,000 years. It's been about 12,000 years since we, you know, homesteaded, planted some crops and started growing to, to flying, you know, to, to sending spaceships into the stars, right? A relatively small blip of time in our collective existed. So when we think about humanity for, for the other 280,000 plus years, our spirituality was deeply aligned with nature. Now this is the same, it's kind of what I would argue is an archaic revival. It's not, we're not going back to worshiping the trees or the sun. We're recognizing our deep material alignment with the universe itself. Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher once asked what we would do when confronted with absolute knowledge. I challenge you today, now is our, our moment to make that choice. But the single truth in itself is not enough to ground a spiritual project. So to that end, we incorporate our oneness with the relational universe. What we're looking at right now, this is a, a map of the universe where each ring is essentially an order of magnitude. So a 10X kind of zoom out. This is the current like, map of the universe as our telescopes have, have, have showed us. And Oneness with the relational universe represents the following concept. In a universe governed by the single truth, reality is only ever an immediate present. And it's a totality of the moment. So what I mean by that is that we have the, 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 all of us sitting here today. And from this moment, extends the entirety of the cosmos in motion. Right? And it's like a slice a little slice of time that we kind of capture. And we can make a, a moment, can be a picosecond, it could be a year. It doesn't matter how we define it. But ultimately, the material nature of being is that all of us sitting here are in fact a single happening, experiencing itself from a bunch of unique perspectives. 
Now, this is nothing new. This knowledge, the oneness of the racial universe, this is the foundation of Vedic, Hindu, Buddhist uh, philosophies, even in many sense, the Tao. It represents, again, this, this unifying wholeness where while the spiritual philosophy is nothing new, the physics and cosmology grounding it is. And I think that's a very kind of critical intersection. We now have our knowledge is kind of intersecting with the framework of reality that represents what we've known for a long time, giving it a, a degree of legitimacy that previously was able to capture. Two weeks ago, uh, Stephen Wolfram was on, Stephen Wolfram was an eminent like, uh, physicist, math, math, mathematician. He was on the Lex Friedman podcast and he was speaking about how the laws governing the universe today in physics are now understood to be specifically our laws. So what do I mean by that? The laws governing physics, okay? So we have gravity, structure of space-time, quantum mechanics, that's branchial space, molecules. All of these work the way we do because we perceive them with the instruments that we have. It's not the other way around. They are uniquely human. What it does is it places humanity deeply at the center of the laws governing our universe. And again, I know this sounds out there, but this is what our most advanced physicists and mathematicians are now growing consensus, consensus and arguing. So that's a deep connection. And all of this, right, our, our observations of these experiments only ever occur within a single moment, right? That moment's a snapshot of time, essentially. And as soon as they occur, and I give, you know, quantum mechanics is a great example. Quantum mechanics exists as a field of probability, right? It's not anything until we look at it. And when we measure, the first thing it does is it interjects information into the past. It gives us a recording. We look away, it's not there. We try it again in a different direction, it'll be what we seek. So this represents, again, the physics and cosmological grounding of the nature of reality, which puts humanity at the center, a total wholeness of being. So I want to talk also about birth lottery and event chains. Earlier in the, in the beginning, I talked about the crisis. The, one of the core purposes of spiritual renaissance, of reorienting ourselves to what is, instead of again, what we thought it was or what we would prefer it to be, is to remove human divinity from randomness. Today, as I've argued earlier, the most statistically important event in your life is where you're born. What country, what laws, what wealth, who your parents are, et cetera. And for many of us, uh, you know, I've had the fortune I'll only speak for myself. I shouldn't say for me. I've had the fortune, right? Born, born in the nor Northeast United States, middle-class parents, good education, a lot of opportunity, et cetera, right? Not a lot of systemic injustice based on my appearance. Birth lottery and event, event change, let me get into event change. Event change represents the idea that all of us inherit a history that we had no say in choosing. So what do I mean by that? It's not... Uh, you know, a disregard for our choices. Obviously, our choices matter, right? In fact, choices are the, the greatest form of divinity we can have in a relational gov universe governed by the single truth. But much of the trajectory that we're on today was put into place well before any of us were born, right? The crisis is a result of hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of human evolution, human thought, human values that have culminated into this kind of existential threat. And the challenge that we face today is that everything we try to do to change it is done within the very structures that perpetuate it. In a relational universe governed by the single truth, we recognize divinity in all, in every individual. They're an aspect of embodied infinity. And therefore, this gives us the grounding to bind our spiritual project to a systemic project. The idea being, Today, there's an immense amount of imagination that's trapped. It's trapped in the systems surrounding people. Right? It's trapped into people who are born into birth lottery. Right? I think if, if I was born into Sudan 25 years ago, the only thing I would know is missiles, fire, war. Right? Trapped. Every human being born in that scenario, trapped. The systemic project is a way to free ourselves from the trappings of birth lottery and event chains that we have created. Okay, again, it's a, it's a, a recognition that our systems do not deserve power over us. They are, they are not enough. We are more than them. And we must be willing to discard them when they no longer serve their purpose. 
So now I'm going to move into individual actualization. Individual actualization essentially is a representation of the development of I. In the book, I break down the, the term self to more actively represent the relationship between an individual and their circumstances within a given moment. Okay, so to that end, we recognize individual actualization as the development of I, systemic actualization as the development of we. Now, individual actualization, uh, in the book, I, I cover a chapter uh, that's the science of individual actualization, like the actual psychology behind it. I'm not going to dive too deep into it. One quick tidbit I will share because it's very common um, Maslow uh, never wrote about a hierarchy of needs, a business person wrote about that. Okay, Maslow's work explained overlapping graphs, essentially overlapping bell curves or a holonic graph or like circles and circles. So I say that because the geometry of being is not a triangle. And that's part of the kind of poison we fed ourselves, this hierarchical vision of, of, of humanity and our ascension. It's not accurate. We're infinite, omnidirectional. Okay, so just a quick tidbit about that. When we think about individual actualization, we base our journey, our our kind of the way we reorganize ourselves and society around cooperation. Today, the systems governing our relationships with each other prioritize competition. I can give a very direct example. The greatest form of cooperation today is transaction. The most interaction we have with others is transacting. So what does that mean? It means two things. The other is something to over, you know, perpetually be overcome. Right? I want to extract as much value from you as possible while giving the least. And more importantly, it always puts us at the risk of subjugation. Every interaction with someone else is a risk of being taken advantage of because our, our most fundamental values encourage that. By orienting ourselves around cooperation, we frame it in a form of cooperative individuality, how we view others and ourselves, cooperative work, right? which is the changing nature of the knowledge economy and the most advanced form of production today, uh, cooperative competition, I want to emphasize, you know, I was a competitive athlete for 20 years. You know, I, I, uh, I love competition, but there's a difference between competition for competition's sake and competition for the exploitation of others. Okay, so when we ground our philosophy of spirituality around cooperation, we reorient ourselves again to more accurately reflect the nature of the universe, the reality that all of us are a single happening a single whole, experiencing itself, obviously, from fractional perspectives, right? But that's part of the beauty, part of the fun. Now, also in self-actualization, uh, I talk about, uh, or excuse me, in, in individual actualization, I talk about the, uh, about cooperation. Let me just see where I'm at real quick. Ah, perfect. The authentic imposter, right? So in, as we are all fractional, in our being, always perpetually inhabiting the immediate present, right? The past is always inaccessible. Our futures are always unknown. All of us act with incomplete information at all times. There's a big part of competitive hierarchical culture that really propagates this fantasy, right? The, I think of high celebrity, you know, uh, the idea that we can, we can be so above and so beyond and so inhuman. I argue that the ideal is the opposite. We stop trying to, uh, you know, to, to, to hide, to diminish our ignorance, and in, instead embrace the fact that we're not going to know everything. And that grounds our cooperation, the fact that we need each other. Right? We are wholly together in this kind of path. Uh, and being an authentic imposter is in many ways also an act of letting go. Letting go of the things we don't need, the people we don't need, the beliefs and dogmas we do not lead. Recognizing that the universe is, it's a relational universe subject to the single truth. We're existing in perpetual change. And our systems do not deserve a dogmatic reverence. They do not deserve our, our cling, our belief, our, our more, most importantly, we should not be associating our identity with things that we create. We are more than them. They'll never be enough. And when we do that, and I think the most obvious example is like politics, right? Many people label themselves in a specific category. I'm this, I'm that. And if you're not this, you're, you know, you're against me. We don't have to go too far to have a conversation with anyone to understand. If we talked about it to each other without labels, most of us have a ton of things in common. 
We share the same concerns, the same beliefs. We want our families to be healthy and happy. We want to live a, a, you know, a life of mild comfort, okay? But when we embrace and we dogmatically attach ourselves to these labels and we make them part of us, you know, we diminish ourselves. That's a core part of being an authentic imposter, letting go of that, recognizing that we're wholly imperfect. Another aspect is our core values. So I developed in the book, and I cover this in more detail in terms of the analysis of them, a new framework of core values to better align ourselves with the nature of reality, a relational universe governed by the single truth. Those core values uh, can easily be remembered as reframe courage. That's a nice acronym for them. But ultimately, the core values are relation, which is the belief and practice of recognizing that we exist in a relational universe, a totality. We're equally the same within a moment. Uh, in terms of equally divine, obviously we're unique. The second is equity. Equity is the belief and practice of fairness in our personal and most importantly, systemic relationships. Flexibility represents the belief and practice of not projecting expectations onto the moment. And these can all be developed with practices and I'll dive into that in a bit. You know, we often confuse our desire to make sense of the world with the belief that everything must make sense, that everything must be what we expect it to be. That's false, okay? When we think about flexibility, it's about embracing the moment for what it is and recognizing our power to redirect ourselves at any moment. That's actually a really quick intersection I'll, I'll make. Um, as human beings, change is incremental, okay? In that we only have X amount of available moments to us, right? And that could be in the context of a day or our lifetimes. In those specific moments, we can only do so much. We only have a finite amount of focus and energy. So change is obviously incremental, but the direction of our change is not. The direction of our change can be exponential. It can be a right angle. And that's what ultimately this conversation is about, is about direction, because direction brings futures into the present. The next one is restraint. Restraint is the uh, belief in practice in discipline choice, both for ourselves and towards others. So obviously it's you know, not, not indulging, uh, not falling off a cliff, indulging in vices, but also most importantly, not developing systems that subjugate one group for the benefit of another. Awareness is our belief and practice of bringing our awareness to the totality of now. The greater we possess the ability to recognize the immediate present, the more powerful we become in redirecting the flow of our time experience. At any point in time, we can change direction. Of course, I would argue that you need a certain level of individual actualization to recognize this, right? If you're struggling to put food on the table, you're working three jobs, you don't see your kids, you know, the only thing you do is eat and work, it's very difficult to be aware, okay? Which kind of grounds our systemic project. But ultimately for those of us who have the capacity, that's an important component. The next is minimalism, the belief and practice of eliminating the unnecessary, right? The minimalist is at home anywhere. So we don't wanna ground our identity and our values to things, to our creation. Again, a, a common theme in our discussion today. Enthusiasm is the belief and practice of fully immersing ourselves in what we do. Whatever direction you choose, you dive into it. We are most divine when we align the two observable infinities, the universe itself and human imagination. When we align those two things in a moment, that is divinity in a moment. I spoke earlier about the salvation adders, heaven, the idea that divinity is unaccessible. No, in a relational universe governed by the single truth, divinity is here and now. We become more godlike by exercising our powers within the moment. And finally, courage, the belief and practice of fearlessness in the face of the unknown. We're always acting to incomplete information, right? Doesn't matter. We need to go forward. We need to, you know, it's, I think the path of least resistance is the crisis, right? If we do, if we stay on the same trajectory we're on right now, temperatures will continue to rise, right? We'll continue to put new, new oil permits out. We're about to cross a threshold. I don't know if you guys heard, um, I think we're at like the crossing that 1.5 uh, Celsius permit, you know, climate temperature threshold, which will radically reshape our ecosystems. And at the same time, we're drilling new oil, you know, uh, issuing new oil permits. Okay, it takes courage to go against the status quo. And that's a core part of recognizing our spirituality. In the book, I developed small and high rituals. I'll keep this pretty brief. Um, 
ultimately customizing, you know, transcendence is, a, is a, a customization, right? There's no set way to do it. In the book, I recommend a few. Meditation, I, I do five breaths, which I love. It's like my awareness ritual. Before I do anything different, I take five breaths to kind of bring myself to the center. Uh, visualization, right, is the practice of bringing futures into the present. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it, you can kind of customize it in any, any way. So long as you're truly immersed in the experience, when you're in that flow state, you're acting in divinity, you're creating. And creativity is that, that, that power humanity possesses. When we bring the new, we bring something that never existed in the universe into existence. Holy divine. High ritual. In the book, I argue for the high dose psychedelic experience. I'm not going to go too into it today. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's very difficult to describe. Uh, it is otherworldly. However, what's not otherworldly or difficult to understand is the plethora of evidence of people who've experienced these things in what I would call a, um, you know, a, a ceremonial atmosphere. I'm not talking about going to a club and doing a bunch of drugs. I'm talking about meditating for two weeks, fasting for two weeks, taking a very high dose in your bedroom with a blindfold on and sitting there for four hours. Okay, that is an ego dissolving experience. And if you haven't done it, I recommend it. We can talk about that later. I'm now gonna move on to systemic actualization. We're kind of drawing towards the, the conclusion of our talk. Systemic actualization, again, represents the development of we. The argument is, how do we free that latent imagination that's trapped in society today? Today, we have organized society in such a way where we essentially have unelected kings controlling specific verticals of society, right? Um, I'm not denying that they worked hard. I'm not denying that they're intelligent people. Okay, what I am denying is that they deserve that power. Ultimately, it also creates functions of society where critical verticals, let's say, for example, like housing. You guys aren't aware, right? There's a major movement today where BlackRock, one of the large, BlackRock, I believe, is the single largest asset holder on the planet, is scooping up middle class homes, right? $500,000 homes. And they're renting them out or they're immediately marking them up. Um, so people like me, Right, who I'm 39, turned 39 last week, don't own a home. To be frank, it's very difficult for me to even consider buying a home right now. Okay, and I and I do you know, uh, you know I'm certainly not wealthy, but for my generation, I'm, I certainly do well. Right, so ultimately, when we think about it, goes back to that billionaire god king crisis. The question again is, does does having an extractive layer on every vertical of society make sense for our collective well being? Because again. In a relational universe governed by the single truth, we're reori re reorienting meaning and value for the totality for all of us. Because I recognize and we recognize that the individual is most free, most powerful when the collective has the same opportunity because they can take advantage of that imagination. They can take advantage of that creation. Today, very few people globally have the opportunity to participate in this kind of work and effort. Systemic actualization relies on what I call self-changing systems. In the cosmology section, we talked about how much of our knowledge, uh, whether it be scientific, legal, uh, economic, et cetera, is based on static principles. It is a form of governing ourselves that persistently reinforces the influence on the past of the past onto the present. My argument is that in, in combination with the changing nature of time, exponential growth, the crisis, we need to shift to a society of self-changing systems where they can revise themselves to meet the needs of the moment. The most ideal structure for this today uh, is, is a structure called DAOs or Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. Um, and essentially what they are is they're like, uh, uh, they're based on a blockchain. A blockchain is a ledger, just like an accounting book. It just, it just records every interaction. And that's extremely important when we think about transparency, right? When we think about building the religion, the non-religion religion of the future, uh, I want to avoid things like what just happened to the Mormon church, right? The whistleblower, they have a hundred, what was it, a hundred million in, in unclaimed residential assets, right? That they're holding on to, billion, oh, <laughs> even worse, right? So when we think about like having a self-changing system, it allows for a deep degree of stakeholdership, okay? So we want to organize society in a way where those participating have the opportunity to benefit from those things. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not arguing for the substitution of one ism for another. This is not about capitalism becoming socialism. This is about a plurality of property and contract laws existing in parallel, okay? Which again, nothing about legal thought says we can't do. Uh, so self-changing systems are a, a core part of that. 
I'm going to talk about, um, oh, you know, before I, this is the eight days, but I do want to briefly talk about law, property, and contract. And we've kind of already kind of hit upon it. But again, I just want to emphasize where we're, we have to let go of these dogmas about a singular form of system. Okay, it is, it is directly responsible for the crisis. It is directly responsible for our, our proactive furthering towards this crisis. And ultimately what it's gonna do is it's gonna negatively impact a ton of middle-class and poor people. Okay, so, and, and when we think about the crisis again, I, I emphasize, I think a lot about it from the context of my, my two and a half year old. Actually, she'll, she's, she'll be three in a month. But uh, you know, so to that end, that, that's how I kind of conceptualize it. So what I propose is a new suite of systemic rights aligned with our spiritual alignment with the relational universe governed by the single truth. Eight verticals that all of us need. And I'm gonna kind of go over each one, one by one. There's food and water, housing and healthcare. These are pretty evident, right? Without these, without security in these verticals, the individual exists in a perpetual state of struggle, right? Food and water, housing, the most obvious. Healthcare, healthcare always leaves us perpetually at, you know, at the risk of destitution. I have no insurance, I break my leg, 30 grand. Okay, I have no money anymore. I can't pay my rent. That doesn't seem like an equitable just organization of society to me. Education is the cornerstone of a systemically actualized society. In the book, it's the, the largest chapter of the, the Eight Dignities. So if this is of interest, I'd check it out. I argue for the, the reorientation of both the content and uh, a character of education, okay? So the way we teach youth, but more importantly, extending education to be perpetual. In many ways, we can imagine the best firms, the best companies becoming the best schools. So you have to kind of deepen education in a wide variety of verticals. Again, going back to our, pro our crisis of productivity and participation. If we don't provide on-ramps for people to upskill and redirect, we're going to have an increasing amount of people who cannot participate in society. And that is not a great thing in the midst of a crisis, okay? Because the most natural you know, trajectory then would be violence to take what they need. Information and communication, Today, we live in an era of abundance, not only of resources, of wealth, of food, uh, but most importantly, of knowledge. But in all of these categories, it's siloed. It's protected by specific large firms. So many people today are not acting with the most advanced knowledge that we possess. When we visualize a systemically actualized society where the individual is free to kind of imagine and create, right, to represent their divinity in the moment in any direction they choose, we want to ensure that they have the capacity to do so with our most advanced knowledge. So to that end, we want to free knowledge. This is also a great direct example of this. If any of you have ever been in academia, right, papers are housed by these uh, publishing companies that pay nothing for the papers, but then charge an exorbitant amount, right? So they have insane profits for work they didn't create, uh, that are gated. So I can't go you know, read a research paper if, uh, if I wanted to, unless I, you know, a nice trick if you want, which I did for the book is you just email the, the scholars and they'll give it to you, you know, for free. Communication represents our ability to just connect with each other. Uh, it can be technological. It can be through the infrastructure. What is really important about the eight dignities that I want to emphasize, these are a suite of rights unbound to the state, unbound to the nation. They exist as global public works. And that's what that DAO structure allows for. And, and that could be a whole other conversation. I can't go too deep into it now. But the idea is that we have to decouple our core dignities from the whims of a political actor. And I'll give you a great example here in Florida. In the last month, we've had a significant amount of bills passed that persecute a minority group. I don't care where you land on the political spectrum. I'm not, it's not about that. It's about a political actor can strip rights away from a group of people, okay? And when we think about the divinity available in each, I say that's unjust and immoral. It doesn't align with the spirituality that I put forth. If these are not connected to a state, then who are they? So a DAO allows for, yeah, it's a great question. So a DAO allows for stakeholdership. So every participant is essentially an owner and it's all done like with tokens on a ledger. So it can essentially be the communities that build them and the participants, so even the healthcare system, you would imagine that people who enter the healthcare system uh, who are paying into it, right? There's still an exchange of, of value. You get a service, you pay into it, but the system itself is governed by an elected body democratically. It's all done on a public ledger. So there's no risk of uh, you know, uh, bribery. There's no risk of funds going somewhere where they can't be. It's all on chain and publicly visible what happens within these organizations. So the idea is again, we form global cooperatives, if you will, around these projects. 
And that can be done now. You know, I know that sounds like a pretty immense task, but what I'm trying to emphasize, and it's difficult, you know, just given the technology kind of behind it, is that we now exist in a space where that can be done relatively seamlessly. Like the technology already exists. It just hasn't been applied in that direction yet. Um, but as early as 10 years ago, it didn't. You know, so there's that's kind of the nature of where we exist. It, this exponential kind of expansion of the universe of information, we're now able to do things that even a decade ago would have been impossible. But what it requires is the choice to do them. And more importantly, the reorientation of our direction away from what we're doing, what has been to what should be or what will be in that case. Uh, and I'm just gonna kind of finish up with, oh, transportation. Transportation represents the, uh, the right to escape. Okay, again, many people today, when we talk about birth lottery, if you're born into an oppressive household, society, et cetera, you have no, no opportunity to get out, okay? That's really important when we think about recognizing the divinity in each individual. I'll also argue that like, when we think about why it should be a global network, we can just consider global shipping. We all need global shipping, moves goods around the world. There's 30 private companies that manage it today. There's an extractive layer on it. It's inefficient, it's uncoordinated. Uh, okay, and it creates a lot of problems. Today, and I mean in the immediate present, we possess the capacity to organize a global shipping network facilitated by artificial intelligence that kind of does the networking, does the scheduling, does the, you know, all of the, the kind of manual work that humans would do that would be orders of magnitude more efficient. And most importantly, cut out the extraction layer. Because again, when we think about goods that serve our collective population, that we all need, in this case, the movement of physical objects across oceans, right? Which is our, our number one way of moving things around the planet today. The question is why, why have an extractive layer? It doesn't do anything except benefit an extreme few. And let's be kidding, ocean shipping is not an innovative industry, right? There's little to no innovation in the industry. The ships are 80 years old, they still run on the, the worst crude oil possible, okay? Um, there's plenty of ways that that could be advantaged through a public system. And then finally, energy, right? We all need energy today. Our need for energy is ever growing. It's not going to stop. So when we think about innate dignity, we want to make sure that we can build energy infrastructure that can support the collective whole. But finally, I'll wrap it up. This has been great. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I want to talk briefly about Spirit DAO for like two minutes. Spirit DAO is the organization. It is a community, a DAO, like I talked about. It's a blockchain-based community. Um, I'm the co-founder of it. We've been working on kind of launching it for about eight months. Um, essentially, it's a, a community that serves three purposes. It serves to further the message that I've talked about today, further knowledge around the racial, relational universe and the single truth. It serves to build value for our community, both internally and physically, so virtually and physically, um, as well as further the eight dignities. Okay, and, and I can kind of dive into that a little bit later at the questions. Um, what you're looking at on the right is kind of an organizational map of where we're at. I'll just briefly explain the symbology and then we'll, we'll, we'll open up for questions and answers. What you'll hear right now is these two rings on the left or the bottom one, two, that represents the infinity, the embodied infinity of the individual. The middle and the right represents the totality, the material infinity of, of reality. They form a single happening within the larger circle, the moment. That, the, that they extend beyond the moment is a core point because we are more than the moments. That is how we express our divinity. We create, we add new things that don't exist within the totality whenever we choose to. And that's how we express and recognize our divinity in the moment. So on that note, I'm going to pause. Thank you guys so much. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, I get excited about this stuff. And I'm so excited to continue the discussion. I'll open it up for q and A. if you guys have any questions. And real quick, sorry, Chris, if you guys want, if you want to connect with me offline, scan that barcode. You have all my information. You could Twitter, Calendly, whatever you guys need. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, just go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions or comments uh, today. And on Zoom, we can put in chat. Yeah, You're sure. gonna come down to uh, the front row here. And I'll fill Donahue the mic over to you. You've mentioned the divinity of the individual yeah. and recognizing the, the divinity of other individuals. What, how do you describe divinity in yeah. that context? So I mean, in any context. For sure. Um, I appreciate that question. The question was, how do we describe divinity, right? So in a relational universe governed by the single truth, the individual human is both of, uh, or is both within an infinite material reality, right? So that's, we're within this infinity of ever present now, but we're also of it. We are a product of it. And therefore we are, we embody an aspect 
Granted, it's a fractional aspect, a very small aspect of that infinity through being a part of an infinite universe. So I argue that the expression of divinity is through the alignment of the two observable infinities, the universe itself and human imagination. Because human imagination is that aspect of that infinity that we contain that allows us to create the new, that allows us to bring things that have never been in existence into reality. So the greater we can give the individual access and agency to maximize that, to maximize their creative powers within a moment in the directions of their choosing, the more divine we become, the more powerful we become. Yeah, you say goodbye. Well, you know, sure, I, you know, I would argue- still in the framework of having a God. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm to, uh, you know, ultimately, if I wasn't clear, I believe we have to kind of give death its due. I, I, I don't believe that the vision of hierarchical divinity, the idea that we, divinity is inaccessible, right? To your point about God. We can only be near God after death. So it's, it's always unknown. We can never access it. We can never know it. Uh, that doesn't align with the nature of reality as it is today. The nature of reality is infinite material change. So therefore, if we are infinity, my question then would be, what could be more more godlike than infinity? What could be more than the totality of all things at all at once? That is the nature of reality. So the question is, how do we align ourselves? How do we give ourselves the opportunity to most be in that flow state where we are part of that, where we are contributing to that creation and change in a direction of our choosing? Um, it, it is a, a departure from, again, the hierarchical notions of salvation that when we die, there's anything. In fact, I would argue that the very notion of heaven after death limits our powers in life. It, it, it gives our, our greatest form into something that we can never know. When in reality, we can know it. We can know it right now because that's the nature of being. Oh, I don't know anything. I'm an imposter. Don't worry, I'm authentic about it. The question is, you know, we have to choose, right? Because that is a good question. How do you know? We don't. You have to choose a direction Ultimately, I'm saying we should choose the direction that our collective knowledge is pointing to right now versus, for example, what historical knowledge has continued to reinforce. Yes. In relation to things like AI and chat GBT, et cetera, uh, you know, all those are really the accumulation of facts and data, okay, and then re-presenting re it. How do we deal with the impact of common sense, emotions, et cetera? Because those really don't come into play. And I don't know if you've ever seen the series, The Paper Chase, okay? Paper the, Chase? The Paper Chase, okay? It was actually a TV series. It was also a movie. But they actually put the computer up against the head of uh, the legal department. And it was a very interesting analysis because every time they ran a model or, or a case, the computer could win. It could cite more cases, et cetera. But what it couldn't do was reason, okay? And that's where the lawyer came in. So how do you see that taking place in all this? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question was, uh, how does AI you know, and, and the emergence of AI play a role? So um, I'll lay some context. When we talk about large language models and like the advancement of chat, GPT, and AI, there's a theme called emergence. So this is what I believe is the most fascinating concept of this. Over time, when you train these language models on certain data sets, they develop new skills independent of the direction they were trained on. So it's an emergent skill. So they learn and can do things that they weren't intended to do. And this has been like the major revelation over the last five years, really, with AI technology. So to that end, you know, AI, so, I mean, in, in our immediate present, like we already know the AIs can do, for example, like they're better at detecting cancer. They're better lawyers than most of the lawyers are today. And, and to your point about like common sense. Now there's kind of two directions we can take the question. One is on our current trajectory, and this is a big fear. If you guys have ever heard the term AI alignment, the, the, the big fear that's like kind of in the space today is on our present trajectory, it is likely that emergence will occur to a degree where the AI could become self-aware. Right? And that argument is based on the, on the following. Our brain has a certain amount of neurons. Right? Neurons are very similar to essentially you know, uh, bits of data exchange on a, on a processing power. Right? So the idea is if you could get to a certain amount of you know, po computing power, you could technically simulate a human brain. 
Will it happen? I don't know. I have some skepticism about a computer's ability to imagine, um, but you know, I don't, I'm not an AI you know, researcher. Now to your point about common sense, I, I would argue that in many ways, common sense, like dignity, these things have been eroded over time by a, by a suite of systems that have perpetually focused on creating otherness. Right, whether it be the crisis of information, truth, and trust, a, a, a society based on transaction, right? So it's in many ways spiritual renaissance, the revised non-religion religion that we're kind of speaking about. And when I say non-religion religion, I'm not asking you to worship worship the state single truth, right? And spoiler alert, single truth requires no believers. The infinite material nature of reality is going to be whether or not we embrace it. The question is, if we orient ourselves with it, what kind of human being best thrives in that environment? And that's why I argued this kind of new framework of core values and kind of spreading this, this new framework of being is vitally important because it, it most deeply expresses our divinity and our ability to kind of change, change ourselves, change the nature of our systems, change our universe. So I think it has to be a proactive effort, if that makes sense. It's not gonna happen. In fact, the opposite, right? If we stay the, the course, the divide will only further. Right? And people will begin, become more belligerent in, in their beliefs in either direction, right? I say these, again, apolitical. Uh, it's not, um, I am very anti-politics in this current state. I believe it's a corporatocracy, right? Like neither party is serving any of our interests. So, um, you know, it's, so essentially, uh, does that answer your question? I kind of get excited about it, yeah. Yeah, because I, I do think it comes down to, you know, and I agree with you common sense has kind of gone out the window in a lot of cases because people are not using good reasoning mm. to come up with. And, you know, the emotions play into it. Oh, for sure. And emotions are obviously far from being static. Yeah, yeah. And, and to your point, right, when, we're, when an increasing number of people are in a state of, of either near destitution or material destitution, emotions obviously get thrown way out of whack, right? When we're just worried about surviving and we can't, like, can I pay the rent this month? Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, my partner and I practice gratitude weekly for the position we're in. You know, much of which is, much of which, to be frank, is, is because of where we were born, right? And who we were born into and the skin color we embody, right? All of this. So thank you. Um, just a comment first. Since childhood, I've always believed in the divinity of every atom. Mm. You know, I've believed that every human being is a, is a product of the universe and is therefore divine, mm -hmm. which makes everything divine, a tree, a dog, yeah. you know, everything that exists has some divinity in it, um, which is why when Joni Mitchell said that we're all billion year old carbon, that really resonated with me because we're all made up of stuff that's been floating around, yeah. maybe for infinity. My question though is, uh, one of my questions is more mundane, um, we hear a lot of talk about quantum computing sure. and, you know, the, the, the ability for a computer to, instead of it's either a one or a zero or a yes or a no to be both. Yep. How do you think that yeah. will affect our view of everything? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Eugene. Um, so the question was how will quantum computing impact, you know, where we're going? So we're, we're kind of, quantum computing is advancing pretty rapidly. And, and to Eugene's point, quantum computing just kind of lays some context. The idea that quantum mechanics exists in a, a state of probability, possibility. It's never anything until it chooses to become something, right? Which is always in relation to what we're looking for. So the question is, how do we stabilize a future? And this is a, a when we think of a, a relational universe governed by the single truth, it's a misconception that we can make the future an object because there's a thing called inter interference, right? The, the very idea of looking for the thing impacts its trajectory. And I'll give you a great example, political polling. The very fact that you're asking questions changes the trajectory of the election, right? In one way or another. So this is something we see all around ourselves. I, I will default, I'll, I'll embrace my authentic imposter. I'm not a, a, a quantum physicist. I'm, I'm not a quantum engineer. I don't know how it will impact uh, the future of, of computing, other than to say that when we unlock its potential, it will be orders of magnitude, right? 10, 100x more powerful than anything we have today. Um, and it's only a matter of time. I would imagine that as a, you know, like AI and quantum computing are going to advance in parallel, that AI is going to be able to see things in the quantum space or logic things in the quantum space 
that we as individuals bound to kind of our fractional being are gonna miss just because uh, like we did, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And that's a kind of core part of the quantum world. Um, I'll, I'll add a little bit more. You, uh, Stephen Wolfram on that interview I mentioned, he talked about branchial space. So branchial space is the idea that time in the quantum world is not a line. We experience it as a trajectory, right? We move forward. We only ever move forward. In the quantum world, time branches like a tree. It, it goes in multi directions and then it kind of comes to a point. And then from there again, it branches out and it can go in many different directions. So ultimately, what we're, um, there's an article published last week um, in a Aeon Magazine, essentially about the theory that, that time might be a physical object and that you might be able to, to kind of, through some advanced mathematics, which is frankly beyond my, my perception of the immediate present, pull a future into the present a little bit more accurately than we can do it today, is the idea. So, I mean, I, you know, the, the short answer is I don't know. Long answer is I've had, I have some fun ideas, but ultimately, I, I don't know. But thank you for the, the question. Uh, do you have another one? A, a Stu on Zoom has, uh, he asks, so what is the end game with this philosophy? Yeah. Or do you actually refer to it as a kind of a philosophy? Yeah, I'd say it's a, a, a collection of philosophies and practices. Stu, thank you for your question. Um, Ultimately, is the, there is no end game. And that is to say that self-actualization, right? Individual actualization, systemic actualization in alignment with the relational universe governed by the single truth is a ever evolving philosophy to meet the needs of the people practicing it and meet the needs of the moment. And that's where it differs from our present spiritual institutions, which are static. You have to do it this way. And if you don't, you know what? And maybe they make some changes over time, but to do that, they have to kind of embrace some hypocrisy. The idea is that our spiritual project will always evolve. Where we are right now, I believe this provides a, a very strong foundation to transform. But I don't believe it will matter in 200 years to the same degree and same frequency it does today. And at that point, it's supposed to evolve. So a quick kind of aside, uh, Stu, on that note, just so you guys are aware, the book that I gave out, that book belongs to the community. I haven't made a dollar off the book. Every book sale supports the community, okay? It is evolving alongside the community of practitioners already. So I wanna emphasize that. Um, it, it's intended to be an ever evolving document, a living document that grows alongside the spiritual needs of the community. Ultimately, you know, in terms of a material end game, the eight dignities would be like the ideal, right? We establish these suite of public works, but I also wanna be candid. I don't believe the eight dignities are gonna solve all of our problems. We're still gonna struggle. We're still gonna want, we're still gonna desire. We're still gonna doubt. There's many things that, that are gonna go wrong even when we can create in our own directions. The point is by that time, we will have built an infrastructure and surrounded ourselves with systems that allow us to change without reliance on crisis, right? Without having to have an ecological disaster at our doorstep to be like, oh, we should probably do something. And that's ultimately the goal of, of spiritual renaissance and binding it to systemic reformation. And we'll add uh, the book to our Ali community uh, bookcase that we have in the main office. That's door A, you can come in and uh, also see the, the other books that we have as well. And uh, Stu replied, I wish you good luck. Thank you, Stu. And on behalf of Ali Dr. College, like to, uh, one more question. Oh, here we go. It seems a little incongruous to me that would advocate for the eight dignities, dignities yeah. and the ability to self-actualize and all to advocating for a $15 an hour minimum wage instead of allowing the marketplace, so to speak, mm. which is, I would you know, I understand that there are various different components of that, but it would seem to me that it would be better to allow things like minimum wage or wages to be set by the value mm. that that employee brings to that quarter, that entity. Sure, sure. So um, I'll kind of tackle that question from two different perspectives. The first is that in many ways, I want to identify that experience. In my experience, you know, doing local activism for some time was an inspiration for the book. Because to your point, uh, 
I felt that it wasn't like the ideal way to do it. It was a success, right? We did it. But also let's kind of go back to your point about the incongruencies. I don't agree that the history of the market supports your, your idea. I agree. I believe that the history of you know, capitalism economies um, is about extraction first and foremost. And nothing about capitalism's history represents that employers will increase wages in alignment with increasing inflation and expenses. And I can give you a great example. There's a chart, I could, we could find it, but essentially, I believe it's from, I don't know if it's from the 50s or the 60s, but essentially there was a point in, in US history where wages and, and profit growth were almost parallel, right? Companies made more money and they treat employees better. Around the 60s, it began to branch. And now there's an immense gap between record-breaking profits and people basically on the poverty line. I mean, think about Walmart, right? Walmart is an active lobbyist for things like social programs because they don't want to pay their people more, right? So, I, you know, I understand, like, this is when we talk about, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying this is your position, but I do believe many people are very dogmatic about markets when nothing about the history of markets supports the analysis that they're they are going to benefit a collective good. Markets are specifically designed to extract value and funnel it upwards. That's what they do. A free market is about purely private enterprise, right? And the structures of law support you know, that framework of being, of, of viewing an individual not as a stakeholder, but as a widget in the machine, right? And the idea is I want to pay you as little as possible so I can extract more for me. Um, so I would challenge you, if that's the argument you would make, give me one example of that actually being accurate. Give me an a example, maybe Costco, right? Maybe there's one company that's kind of done a great job of kind of keeping up with wages. But statistically across the board, I don't think that's an accurate statement. Well, I'm not necessarily saying that it is an accurate statement. I'm saying it seems like the, in order to reach We've got to get away from mandating. But if you don't mandate, right? So if cost of living is rising, inflation's rising. Who, but, gets, who gets to mandate? Well, why not? I mean, that's the, the that's a state right. God kings. Well, they do yeah. right now, right? But uh, how do we break that? How do we get away from that? Oh, that's a great question. How okay, you, yeah. You know, get to the point where you can allow. Oh, I really appreciate that. Um, so the question was, how do we? How do you get? How do you even begin to tackle the problem of the billionaire god king, right? So, uh, of course, this is—it's all just legal arrangements, right? So, in the book, I, I develop a, a concept called a corporate module, which you can ima imagine as a package of little legal-like frameworks that you can inject into a corporation. So, for example, you could develop an economy where you have the eight dignities provide a, a highly socialized bottom. So, the idea is that you know. Um, you're, you're not at risk of destitution based on birth lottery, or I'll give you another example since we're on the notion of free market. In my 20s, I founded a, a Web2, an e-commerce company. I ran it for, I was CEO for eight years. We ended up getting acquired. Around year six was when I started to make any money. If I had failed at year five, I would have been in my late 20s. I would have no money, no savings, um, no you know, prospects, essentially. In our present free market economy, the price for failure is extremely high. I would argue if we socialize the bottom hypothetically, right, the eight dignities, these suite of public works, you would increase the competition in the middle exponentially because there'd be no risk of destitution for experimenting. There'd be no risk of not having a place to live or food to eat or healthcare if you didn't have a job. So you could innovate in your own ways. Now, to your point about the billionaire, I'm also a believer that we, we don't, I don't think unlimited power for the individual is a necessary or natural philosophy. I don't. I think we can easily have wealth caps. The in my in the book, I suggest the Caldor tax by Nicholas Caldor. Essentially, it's very simple. You tax the difference between um, income and savings. Okay, so it's a, a very you you make X and you have you have a savings X, and the difference is what you tax. Now, what's beautiful about it is the tax rate can be. Uh, and one quick caveat: anything not count as uh, saved is count as spent. Okay, or excuse me, anything not spent is kind of saved. So it like really diminishes the ability to hide wealth. So if you don't report it, we just say you saved it. I don't care what you did with it. If you don't report it, it's saved. You tax those savings. Now, why that matters is the rate you tax, on, it's a consumption tax. So the rate you tax can vary. So if, I'm, if I make $30,000 a year, I'm a single mother, I'm gonna pay 0%, doesn't matter. 
on, on the dollars I spend. But if I'm a billionaire, I can tax you $5 for every one you spend. So it eliminates all the loopholes because at the end of the day, there is a certain amount of consumption everyone's going to embody. Right now, with that said, if you do the math on a billionaire, you can, if you spent, do the math in the book, if you spend $1,000 per hour for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you will not spend a billion dollars, okay? So when we think about wealth, the idea is the way we can kind of begin to mitigate this is through taxation schemes that tax consumption at valuable rates. And those rates can be based on tiers of, of savings. You get me excited about taxation now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. And that would probably be up to a, a to your point, a state or a nation, you know, depending on what they, they want to do. Um, I'm not, you know, I think many people, especially in kind of my generation, kind of working on this stuff are anti-statist. Um, I don't believe that. I believe the state's a tool. It's like a hammer, right? To hate the state is to like hate a hammer. It's just an organization of law. The problem, of course, is right, it's an inequitable organization as it's designed today. But that doesn't mean we can't have equitable states under a different paradigm. But I would argue kind of full circle, it boils down to the frameworks of meaning and value that we embody as individuals. Yes. And individuals are different. Yes, they are. are motivated differently and rewarded. Yeah, no, I agree. Can, can be satisfied, some of us lesser than others, mm. by different. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. So I, I think I'm so yeah, you go ahead and just kind of rephrase kind of what he's saying. Okay, so the question I believe is like obviously being all of us being individuals, even with our divinity, we're gonna have different motivations, different experiences, different desires, different values of, of what we seek, right? So to that end, I'll say this: I want to be clear. My argument today is not about equality of outcomes. It's not about the same thing for everyone because you'll never close the gap between a novice and a master. You want to reward people who develop mastery in specific directions. So you want to reward them well, right? The, the question, it's less about equality of outcomes and more about how do we maximize the individual's access and agency to participate in society? Because today, the systems governing our relationship with each other they exclude a very large swath of people based on birth lottery, based on economic, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to that end, I, I believe in a, in, a, in a systemically actualized society, that question answers itself because you have value being created in you know, nearly infinite more directions than is possible today. And I think that kind of it becomes that self-learning machine. So it's, again, it's not about making sure everyone gets the same thing or, or is rewarded the same way, but I will say this, if, if your counterpoint is like, well, what if I desire to have $100 billion and I desire for everyone else to be poor? Tough luck. You know, like this is a relational universe. No individual has the right to diminish another, to develop systems that purposely push down another so they can rise. And I think that's where we find ourselves today is we have a long history of this. Again, rooted in salvation narratives of spirituality, that hierarchical spirituality justifies the grouping of in-groups versus outsiders. What we want to diminish, and there will always be groups. Again, my argument is not against that people are going to group. It's about preventing people from being able to subjugate one group to benefit another, which is where we exist in our immediate present. This is the history we inherited. Again, it's no one's fault. This was well in motion before any of us were born. Uh, but here we are. Right? Hmm. Uh, you know... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't agree with, I don't disagree with that it'll be difficult. Yeah, that's, that's where that core value of courage comes in. It's gonna be difficult, it's not easy. It's, but ultimately it's about choice. It's about dogmas, right? It's about what do we represent and, and why do we justify, like, again, 
there's a justification for it, right? And ultimately, in this case, in the political case, it's about scapegoating, right? Like things are going wrong, blame this person. I mean, there's plenty of wars that I can remember that you know we're focused on the same exact thing. Those, that's why we're wrong. Those people, right? Let's persecute them. Um, and that's a very common, you know, totalitarian authoritarian vision um, to, to that note. To your point about the U.S., I agree. Look, now's the best time ever to be alive, and the U.S. has done some great things. We're also, you know, let's not forget the military hegemony of the world. We export weapons for profit. We are the reason that countries are bombed. We are, that is a major industry of ours and it's a for-profit industry. So you can't, yes, we've done good things, but again, it's all in relation. We do some pretty awful things. So, and, and we're, we, we justify those awful things by a hierarchical vision of the world, of a hierarchical vision of who we are. And that's what we're trying to, you know, that's what Spear Dow, that's what this book is trying to do. It's, it's try, in the beginning, I, I made a statement and I'll kind of close with it. The problem is not that we're here. The problem is that we've lacked alternatives. Everything we've done has been trying to create change within the very systems that are perpetuating the crisis. This is a feeble, granted, but a, an attempt at an alternative. Alternative belief system, alternative thought, alternative spirituality, and most importantly, right, kind of combining them into a systemic project. So again, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. On behalf of Ali Dr. College, I'd like to thank Ron for being here today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. That was great, guys. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.